Hello everybody and welcome to Advanced Functions. Today we're going to be doing chapter 8.3 which is still part of combining functions. Today we're actually going to be learning that the last type or the last way to combine functions which is called composite functions. So we're going to discuss what a composite function actually is. We're going to determine how to find the composition of two functions and also how to evaluate the composite of a function. Lastly, we're also going to talk about other key concepts you must familiar familiarize yourself with for this chapter. So let's start on that. First, again, we're going to talk about what a composition of two functions looks like. So the way we could actually find this out is in the following. So f of g of x, which is how we would read this, denotes a composite function. That is one in which the function f of x depends on the function g of x. It can also be written in the following format. It would be an f with like a little circle in the middle, g, and then all of x. We've seen a really similar notation before when we're subtracting or adding uh, two functions. So we would have like f minus g and then x. So when it comes to determining an equation for composite functions, we simply substitute the second function into the first as read from left to right. So to determine f of g of x, we substitute g of x uh, for x in f of x. So that might sound a little bit complicated, but I can assure you it is not. So here I've provided two examples that I will go over where we figure out what f of g of x equals to in different scenarios. So the first scenario is the following. If g of x is equals to 1 over x plus 3, and f of x is equals to 3x squared plus x minus 6, what is f of g of x? So as we talked about, we simply need to substitute g of x for x and f of x. So I'm writing down what the composite function is, and then now instead of writing g of x, I'm actually writing its equation. So we get f of 1 divided by x plus 3. We know this notation. This notation means that everything within this bracket must be substituted for our x value. So now we take this equation here and every x we had becomes 1 divided by x plus 3. So that is what our second line looks like. So we get 3 times 1 over x plus 3 squared plus 1 over x plus 3 minus 6. So from here, since we know we like to simplify all of our functions, we're going to do that. So we're going to first of all expand these brackets. We don't want to square uh, with these two terms, and so we're just going to actually open those up. And we get 3 times 1 over x squared plus 6x plus 9 plus the remaining terms. Now we have 3 times a fraction. We know we just simply multiply uh, the constant by the numerator. And so what we get is 3 over x squared plus 6x plus 9 plus 1 over x plus 3 minus 6. So you can actually check this by going into Desmos, typing in what g of x is equals to in this exact notation, f of x and what it is equals to, and then you can actually type in f of g of x, and it will automatically graph that function for you. So then once you actually get the graph, you can uh, also insert whatever you got as your answer. And if those functions or those graphs overlap perfectly, that means you solved the question correctly. For our second example, it is actually super simple. We have f of x is equals to 4 to the power of x, and g of x is equals to sine of x. Again, we need to figure out uh, how to do this. We see that f of x is our outer, 
equation and g of x is our inner equation. So we're going to substitute sine of x for x and f of x. And so we get f of sine of x. And again, when we have this notation, we simply put whatever we have in the brackets for the old x term. So 4 to the power of x now becomes 4 to the power of sine of x. Again, you can put this into decimals and check whether or not it's true. Now that we know how to determine a composite of a function, we need to talk about evaluating the composite function. So to evaluate a composite function f of g of x at a specific value, we need to substitute the value into an equation of the composite function and simplify. Or we have another way, we can actually evaluate g of x at the specific value and then substitute whatever value we got into f of x. Since we have two ways to evaluate a composite function, I thought it'd be pretty neat to look at both of them. So in this example, we're going to actually evaluate g of f of x at x is equal to negative 5. We're also given that f of x is equal to 3 cos of x minus 2 and g of x is equal to x squared minus x plus 4. So we have a lot of different components to this question, but again, it is actually really simple once you get the hang of it. So let's look at our first way. Our first way is again figuring out what the composite of the function actually looks like and then substituting in the value. Since we're given g of f of x, we need to actually substitute f of x into our inner terms. So we get g of 3 times cos of negative 5 minus 2. I immediately substituted negative 5 in because that's what we're trying to evaluate. However, you could keep this as x until you get over here where you substitute it in and solve for your answer. Again, this is just a preference thing. It also might be a teacher preference thing, so make sure you uh, figure, out, figure out that with your teacher. But either way, once we get this, we need to substitute this into g of x. g of x was x squared minus x plus 4, so now every x became this term here, which is our second line. Over here, we can now just uh, simplify the inner brackets, which is negative 5 minus 2, which we know is equal to negative 7. Now we can take the cosine of negative 7 times it by 3. The most important thing for this evaluation here is to understand what um, measure we're using. Because remember, we have degrees and radians. And as I've said right in the beginning of chapter 4 and chapter 5, we are only going to be using radians in this chapter. So here, x is equal to negative 5 radians. And so, when we are evaluating this here, we're actually going to be using the radian mode on your calculator. So make sure you're in the right mode. If you're not in the right mode, you will not get the right answer, which is very, very unfortunate. So make sure you keep an eye out for that. Uh, but yeah, once you evaluate those brackets, you should get this approximate value here. Now, just put this value into your calculator once again, and you should get this as your final answer. Now, let's look at our second way. The second way is substituting our, sorry, we're first of all going to solve for f of x, then we're going to substitute whatever we got f of x for, uh, as our answer into g of x. So f of negative 5 is equal to 3 cos of negative 5 minus 2. Again, radians, put that into your calculator, and you should get this answer here. Now we're going to take this answer and plop it into g of x. So g of our answer is equal to our answer squared minus our answer plus 4. Put that into your calculator, and you will get the result. As you can see, both of them are the exact same value, which means that we solved it correctly. Also, as you can see, our second last lines are the same. So really, the difference is uh, your personal preference. For the first one, uh, it might help you understand what is happening, actually. 
you it will help you practice making composite functions and evaluating them faster it will also help you because you don't have to round as much so what I mean by that is nobody is stopping you from not going to this part you could simply put these values into your uh, calculator right here and you should get approximately the same answer the only reason why I evaluated them was to show you how you would be getting the same answer uh, no matter what however Again, if you were not to do this, you'd actually be rounding less because instead of having uh, five uh, figures here, you would have as many figures as three cos of negative seven is. For the second version, I have to agree, it looks a lot more cleaner. It'll probably help a lot of you visualize and understand the procedure. We know how to evaluate a function at a point. And so doing it two times is not as difficult as performing a, br a brand new procedure that you've just learned. So at the end of the day, it's really coming to preference. If you want to do the first way, you can do the first way. If you want to do the second way, you can do the second way. Just make sure your teacher is fine with it uh, and always follow what they say. So now that we're done the main part of this chapter, I want to mention some important concepts you also need to know to succeed. These concepts might be more or less of a thinking uh, type of material that you might or might not encounter, but I still feel like they're really important concepts to discuss in case they do appear on your tests or exams. So the first case is what if you're dealing with the composite of an inverse of a function. So we haven't actually done a lot of work with inverse functions in this uh, chapter or honestly in this whole course. The only time we really touched up on them was for example in chapter 7 and chapter 6 when we're talking about what a logarithmic function is. Uh, that was probably the biggest time we've been working with them. However, besides that, there was not a lot of info. But now, we need to talk about the composition of these two. So we know what a inverse of a function is. We know how to evaluate it. If you don't remember, we simply switch the x and y values. So your y will become x and x will become y. And now you're solving for y. But with that definition, we need to figure out this. If the inverse of a function f is also a function, and this is really, really important to know, if the inverse is not a function, you cannot do this. Uh, we're going to call uh, that inverse, though, f to the power of negative 1, or f in, uh, the inverse of f, then f of f of inverse of x is equals to x for all of x in the domain of f. Again, that sounds super complicated. But all we're saying is that this operation here will, go, will give us all the values of x uh, when they are part of the domain of f. So if x was not part of the domain of f, it will not be an answer. So similarly, if we were taking the inverse first and then the function, we would have uh, the answer equals to x for all of x in the domain of the inverse of f. You might be confused on how we're doing this, and so I provided a simple example right here on how we could evaluate this. So for example, let's find the f of inverse of f of x, for f of x is equal to 2 over x plus 1. So to find the inverse, we need to let it equal to y. Remember, we need two variables. We need an x and y variable, and so that's what we're doing here. I'm going to say that 2 divided by x plus 1 is equals to y. Now we're going to interchange the x and y variables. So our y became an x and our x became a y. Opening these brackets, we can actually move plus 1. Uh, sorry, we can actually divide 2 divided by x is equals to y plus 1. 
you might be confused about why that happens, but I always personally do just simple math in my head. So I'd say like, okay, uh, three is equals to six over two. So then two is equals to six over three. So in our case, uh, the six is actually our two and our three is actually our x. And so we get y plus one is equal to two over x. Again, this is just something I do to help me think, to help me quickly visualize something on the spot. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable with doing that, you could always cross multiply and then try to evaluate for y plus one that way. But once you get to this stage and you should get here, you would bring the positive one to the other side and you would get that the f of the inverse of f of x is actually equals to 2x minus 1. Again, remember that we let y equal to the inverse, and so this is actually what our inverse is equals to. Now that we know what that is equals to, we can start solving. Also, this here should be the f of the inverse of f, not f minus 1, but we'll let it slide for now. Either way, you'd just be substituting this value for f of x. And so we get f of 2x, 2 divided by x minus 1. Uh, substituting this into our original function, we get 2 divided by 2 divided by x minus 1 plus 1. The negative and positive ones cancel out, and all we're left with is 2 divided by 2 divided by x. Again, uh, this would mean 2 times x over 2. So the 2s would cancel out, and we would get our value of x. As you can see, this explanation takes a little bit, but once you understand how it works, you could always use this, you know? Like, you'd never have to go through this proof again as long as you understand how it was done. Lastly, I'd like to talk about actually being able to graph these functions. So again, the domain of the functions will always be common to the domain of both of the component functions. So if you had one of the functions not being defined at 1 and the other one not being defined at negative 7, the composite function would not be defined for 1 and negative 7. Once you understand that, we also can use our basic understanding of all the functions we've learned to actually help us graph. So for example, if we go back here, and we were trying to graph this function, we know what a uh, force to the power of x function looks like. We know that it should be crossing or having an intercept at 0 and 1, right? We also know what a sine of x graph looks like. You know, we know that it's periodic, that it'll be repeating after the period of 2 pi. So if at 0, sine of x is equals to 0, then 4 to the power of 0 is equals to 1, so our first point should be at 0 and 1. So you could use those key points that we learned about for each of these functions to actually help us graph the new ones. So I'd recommend just making a simple like table of values for the x and the new functions. Uh, and then trying to plot it that way. I really don't think your teachers are gonna force you to use, um, for example, mapping notation or transformations of graphs to graph these functions. So don't worry too much about that. If they do, they'll explain the exact procedure they want. So keep an eye open for that. With that being said, this is all we had to cover today. There's some questions revolving around real world applications, like in the chapter 8.1 and 8.2, again with like revenue and cost and profit, things like that. But it'll all revolve around your understanding of how to evaluate and determine a composite function. If you understand that, you shouldn't have a problem. Um, the only difference might be understanding what that means, but as I always say, uh, if you're talking about cost and about revenue and you're taking the cost of 
the revenue of the amount of shoes you sold, you can pretty much already understand that, the, uh, for example, the revenue heavily relies on the cost and the cost heavily relies on how much shoes you make. So that's the kind of thing you need to understand. But yeah, either way, I hope you had a really fun time listening to today's lesson. I understand it might be a little bit more complicated because again, all of chapter eight just heavily relies on you understanding everything we've done up to this point. If at any point you forgot how to, for example, find the inverse or how to uh, find the key points of a graph or how uh, to actually substitute values in for a function, I'd always recommend going back to my previous videos since they're all labeled by chapters, you can easily figure out where around um, the video should be. But again, if you have any particular questions you want to ask me, leave a comment or uh, email me. Uh, I won't have a problem with that. Either way, thank you for listening. I hope you had a wonderful time and I can't wait to see you next time. Bye bye.